go ahead and get going here. Good morning, happy Easter, happy Resurrection Day to those tuning in online. And we got a good crowd here in the room. Thanks for being here. Joy will be here. Um, I think Greg, so I'm not sure about anybody else. Um, all right, we're going to wrap up our journey from Gethsemane to Golgotha and beyond. So I guess today is beyond. <laughs> We've already gone through Gethsemane. Uh, we've been through uh, Golgotha last week, and what we've been doing, for those who haven't been here, is we're taking all four Gospels and doing a parallel study of these significant events, um, going through the Garden of Gethsemane of when he was taken into custody, through Golgotha itself last week, and now the Resurrection. Uh, so I've kind of ironed this down to about seven major events that occurred the morning of the resurrection. So we're going to look at all of them. Uh, as last week, Zachary kind of pointed out, he's like, I didn't realize all the variations in the stories of the story of Golgotha. Well, there's even more in this one. <laughs> um, but we'll kind of rationalize that. And I like to do it this way uh, to equip you guys because this, specifically, this story is one of the most, well, cherished for us as Christians and believers, but one of the most attacked by the atheistic community. They say there's so many inconsistencies with all the stories and all that. Y'all can't, you know, the most important day of your religion, and you can't even get it right and all this sort of stuff. I've had all kinds of arguments about that sort of thing. So I want to iron out some of that to maybe explain it, and y'all can chime in and let me know your thoughts as well. Uh, but we're going to start in John because he gives us the most details. It seems to be the most comprehensive of the stories. So we'll go through John. He covers it in 18 verses. Uh, then we'll go back and we'll hit uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke and just at least discuss the variations. So here are the seven events uh, that I have established in my study this past week that happened. Uh, first of all, we're told it is the first day of the week, and at sunrise, women came to the tomb. So the first day of the week at sunrise is when this occurred, which is Sunday. That's why we celebrate church on Sunday now instead of Saturday. So the Jews still go to Sabbath on Saturday, but the Christians, we've established our day of worship as Sunday because it's the first day of the week. The second major thing that happened is that there were women coming to the tomb bringing spices. Uh, so that's the second significant event. The stone was rolled away is the third major thing to point out. There was some sort of an angelic encounter. That's where most of the variations come from in the stories. Um, then we have the response of the women who were there. And then we have the response of the disciples whom they went and told. Then we get, in two of the four accounts, a story of Mary Magdalene meeting Jesus in person uh, by herself. Uh, only two of the four Gospels give us that story, but that seems to have happened later in the morning after the disciples came, or Peter and John, we find out, came, and they had their reaction. So those are the seven things that I've kind of established. Uh, so if we look in John 20, it says in verse 1, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. So what do you all think? Does that mean she literally saw the stone as it was being rolled away, or it was just already removed? It seems to be taken away. It means it was already done when she showed up. Then she runneth and come to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Who's that? John. That's John. He always identifies himself in that way. And so Mary Magdalene goes, sees the tomb is empty, or the stone has been rolled away anyway. And she comes and tells Peter and John. Now I tend to really focus on this one, not only because it gives us the most details, but according to the accounts, there were only two disciples at the tomb, Peter and John. All the accounts that were given names, Peter is consistent. John mentions 
that he is there as well. So I really lean on John's account for that reason. That's first-hand experience. So we see here verse 3. Um, well, continue verse 2. Uh, and she said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, which is the tomb, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, again that's John, and came to the sepulcher, and they ran both together, and the other disciple, again meaning John, did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. I kind of think it's funny that he was the one that pointed out that Peter was a guy that cut the Roman guard's ear off, right? And now he's saying, yeah, I ran him getting to the tomb. <laughs> so we kind of wonder if there's some little playful banter going on between the two of them. So they're both running. John wins the race. And it says here, and he's stooping down, meaning John, and looked in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet he went not in. So John gets there first, stoops down, looks in, and sees the linen clothes laying there. But he didn't go in the tomb. This, my, my Bible described it as strips of linen. Strips of linen. Did, that? Could it, you know, it's kind of like a mummy, you know, where they wrap yeah, people yeah, up. Wrap, yeah. So they were unwound and laying there. Um, or the, the, yeah, I mean, I wasn't there, so I don't know the details. Uh, but the idea, y'all ever seen Return of the Jedi? You know, where Yoda just vanishes and the clothes just kind of fall? That's kind of the picture I get. I don't know if that's right or not. But that's the image that I get, that he just kind of vanished and his body left the clothes and the clothes just kind of fell in place. I don't know if that's true or not, but that kind of makes sense. Um, verse 6 says, Then come a Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, so they had a wrap that they would put around the head of the bodies, um, but wrapped together in a place by itself. It was not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple. So John does eventually make it inside the tomb, uh, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. What do y'all make of that? He was a non-believer before that moment. They didn't understand all the teachings before that. Right. I think this was a clearer picture of everything. I don't know that. I don't know that he believed the resurrection. It just because. Right, that's the issue. It's not that he didn't believe Jesus, it's that he couldn't believe what he was seeing. And once he went in there and saw it up close for himself, that he believed, okay, this is actually happening. As he said, kind of thing. So that's what that means. Um, for as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. That's a kind of interesting verse just kind of thrown in there. What do y'all make of that? Verse 9. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Still wouldn't understand it. Yeah. Right, and this scripture that is being mentioned here is Psalm 1610. If you want to go check that out. It's just a foretelling um, that he must rise from the dead. So it's a fulfillment of Old Testament scripture, which all of these things have been the case. That Jesus fulfilled these uh, things foretold hundreds and even thousands of years before. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. Then we get a, a story of Mary Magdalene. We'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, but that's pretty much the story other than Mary's encounter with Jesus. I want to go back and hit the other uh, three Gospels and kind of do a comparison and see if we can make sense of this. So I'm going to go back to Matthew 28. All of these accounts are the last chapter of each Gospel. Uh, so Matthew 28 tells his account. So in context, in John, basically in verse 1, we get three things. We get that Mary Magdalene came early when it was yet dark on the first day of the week. We also see that uh, she being named Mary Magdalene, we know who this is, she, third thing, she saw the stone taken away, it means already removed from the sepulcher. Now what does Matthew tell us? He uses four verses to tell us the same story. 
Here we see in verse 1, in the end of the Sabbath, as it was beginning to dawn before the first day of the week, which means it was still dark, about to dawn, so those facts line up together, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to, the sep to see the sepulcher. So we see a second person. Who's the other Mary? From our previous study, she's identified as Mary, the mother of Jesus. So who's Mary Magdalene? She's the lady, Mark tells us, that uh, Jesus cast seven demons out of. Yeah, okay, she's so just a follower. The Mary of Mary and Martha. It wouldn't have been that no, Mary. that's a different, that's a whole different Mary. Yeah. yeah, but it wasn't her. No, it was not her. This is just another person that he had helped, and she became a very devout follower of Jesus. Now, to read all these in context, we kind of have to get rid of some preconceived notions that we've maybe always been taught or thought. <laughs> it does not say, well, you'll see in the other accounts in Mark and Luke that they saw this thing or they heard this thing. Matthew does not give us that. Here, it does not say that these women saw what happened in verses 2 um, and 3 or even verse 4. We assume they saw sometimes, but it's not, it doesn't say that they saw these things happen. It just says, Mary and the other Mary were coming to see the sepulcher. And behold, in my rationale, my study, I'm visioning this as while they're walking towards the sepulcher, there was a great earthquake, and the angel of the Lord, it says, descended from heaven, and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. That's kind of a cool image. And his countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. There's no mention that the ladies actually witnessed that. This is stating that's how the stone got rolled away. What are y'all's thoughts on that? Anything? Who witnessed it then to tell? Didn't they go early to put spices on the boat? Well, that's what they were heading. This is well, they're heading there to do that. Yeah. The, um, the other three accounts just mentioned when they got there, they saw the stone had already been rolled away. Right. They did. None yeah. of them say that they saw it being rolled away. Right. You know, they went as a group. We do do know that well, there was a it, group of women. Yeah, and. Two guys who raised to get to the tomb. With me, yeah, John gives us that account. See, that's a little out of sequence, though, with some of yeah. it. That's why we're trying to iron out all this stuff to get right. the sequence of events. So at this point, Matthew has just said, Mary and Mary are showing up. We don't know if they saw this. I don't think they did. But we know that how the stone got rolled away is the angel of the Lord came, rolled the stone back, and sat on the stone. That's what Matthew tells us. His countenance was like lightning, his raiment was snow, and for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. So we know that the keepers saw it. Those are the guard, the Roman guards. Weren't they the ones that rolled the stone in the first place? The no. Remember last week we found out that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus rolled the stone over the tomb. But the Roman guards are who sealed it. Okay. And then they're standing there taking guard over, making sure they don't come and roll the stone away and steal the body. Then we see a mention of the angel answering the women. I don't see where they asked a question. So maybe some of this is left out of the account. Or maybe it's just their presence there merited a response. Where's Jesus? Where's the body? Right. So it says, The angel answered and said unto the women, Fear ye not, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. So that implies to me they didn't even ask. They were just, the angel knew what they were looking for and why they had shown up. Verse 6 says, He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay. So who's saying this? The angel of the Lord, right? There's no mention that this angel was in the tomb, as the other accounts give us. 
This is possibly the angel that rolled the stone away and was sitting on the tomb, right? He speaks to these ladies and says, He's not here, He's risen. Come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell His disciples that He has risen from the dead. And behold, He goeth before you into Galilee. Who's that? Jesus is already left. He's going into Galilee. There shall ye see Him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. Now we, go ahead. Well, it does seem to be different because when Mary in John's account runs and tells Peter and John, they say, somebody's taking the body and we don't know where he is. Right. But here the account says the angel told them that right. he was risen right. and to, that he would be coming to see them in the city. Right. So. So maybe there's multiple accounts of them showing up. We don't know. That's, that's why we're kind of going through this, kind of see all these differences. Then we get a story we don't get anywhere else. Here it says, As they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail, which means rejoice in the Greek. And they came and hailed him by the feet and worshipped him. And Jesus said to them, Be not afraid, go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. And that's the end of really all the account. We don't get the story of Mary Magdalene. We get the story of one angel named the angel of the Lord who rolled the stone away. He addresses them being there and tells them to go tell the disciples. That's all Matthew gives us. Right? So if we go to Mark, this is Mark 16. These are, this is the first four. He really covers the first four accounts. Um, the four, four, first five accounts, rather, that I've established. Uh, this first day of the week, the women came, the stones rolled away. There's some kind of angelic encounter, and then there was a response of the women. And that's all we get from Matthew of the whole account. So Mark tells us, when the Sabbath day was passed, Mary Magdalene and the mother of James... And Salome, we learned through the last couple of weeks that the Mary mother of James is Jesus' mother because Jesus had four brothers, James, Joseph, Judah, and Simon, right? We learned that Salome, through the study last week, that is the wife of Zebedee, the mother of James and John, the disciples. So here it mentions three women came and had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came into the sepulcher at the rising of the sun, so it's still dark. That's consistent with everything we've read so far. And they said among themselves, Who shall roll a stone away from us from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. That tells us they did not see the event of the stone being rolled away. They were just talking about it beforehand. They were just talking about how are we going to do this. Because they went to put spices on the body. Possibly during that conversation is when the angel came and did it for him. I don't know. Right? Uh, but we put those two accounts together, we can kind of get a picture of what happened there. Now, this is different. It says, when they looked, they saw that the stones rolled away, for it was very great, and entered into the sepulcher. They saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in long white raiment, and they were affrighted. And he said to them, Be not affrighted, you seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen, he is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter, like that, and he goeth before you into Galilee, and there you shall see him as he said unto you, showing that Jesus has already spoken these things prior to his death, burial, and now resurrection. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled. And were amazed, neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. That freaks people out a little bit because it says, well, here it says they didn't say anything to anybody. I, I tend to lean on probably along the way. They didn't, tell, they didn't bother to stop and tell anybody until they got to the disciples, and then they told the disciples. Because the other account said that they went and told the eleven. So what do we make of these two accounts so far? It does not say 
that they went into the sepulcher in Matthew's account, but it also doesn't say that they didn't. They could have just gone on in there and that's where they saw the angel. It doesn't say they didn't go in. It doesn't say that they did. It just says, the angel answered and said unto them, he is not here, he is risen, go. So that part of the story is very consistent. It could just be that Matthew did not mention that they went into the tomb. We, again, we try to read into these things, things that maybe aren't there. So we have to use a little bit of an investigative mind to put some of this stuff together. Mark tells us they went into the tomb and that's when they had the conversation with the angel, a young man, it says, sitting on the right side. So for the most part, those are really pretty consistent when you take into consideration maybe part of the story wasn't told in Matthew. And then we get, we'll go ahead and hit this while we're here, we get the, uh, actually we'll wait on that, we'll come back to that. Uh, the story of Mary Magdalene meeting Jesus. It's a very brief story. Let's jump on to Luke and look and see what Luke had to say. So Luke 24 is where we're at for these accounts. Um, again, so far, Matthew and Mark stop the story at they met an angel they were told to go tell the disciples and they went out to do so we don't get the story of the disciples showing up at the tomb we don't get that in Matthew or Mark we do get the story of Mary Magdalene meeting Jesus now Luke gives us a little more information than Mark and Matthew did so here it says, upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the sepulcher, bringing spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. There we see that there's a group. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. So they did not see it being rolled away. They found it rolled away. Right? And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. So according to this count, they did go into the tomb. Matthew must have just left that out for whatever reason. Seems like part of his conversation is just not written down. But Mark tells us they went into the tomb. Luke tells us they went into the tomb. Now Luke says it came to pass. Um, they were much perplexed thereabout. Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Is that a contradiction? Well, where there's two, there's also one, right? Yeah. <laughs> Mark could have just pointed out the one because that was the one that spoke to them, maybe. I don't know. But this says that there were two men standing by in shining garments. And they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth. And they said to them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? Now here it says, They said unto them, meaning both angels. And that's what it says. So we've got to read it and believe it, right? Verse 6 says, He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet uh, when he was yet in Galilee, saying, and these are the quoted words of Jesus, the Son of Man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day arise. And they remembered his words, and they returned from the sepulcher and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. So there's evidently a bunch of people there with the eleven. We do know from continuing in Luke, which we won't do today, but there's a story of the road to Emmaus um, where we find out there's a group of people walking and Jesus shows up and talks to them and all this. So they did tell more than just the 11 because the others found out about it and they understood what was going on. It does seem if you continue to read. Now verse 10 tells us it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, we know that's Jesus' mother, and other women that were with them, which told these things unto, to the apostles. So there was a larger group of people, it seemed like, all of them showing up, which would make sense. I mean, you know, it's dark still. There probably wouldn't be just one or two women walking <laughs> in the dark to a place that's unsure what they're going to run into. So there's most likely a group of people that would have went there. And so they went and they told the apostles and it says, And their words seemed to be as idle tales, and they believed them not. And here we get a little blurb of, Then arose Peter 
and ran to the sepulchre, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laying by themselves, and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. Very slim version of the story, but it says that Peter ran, we know that from John, and that he, stooping down, beheld the linen clothes laying by themselves, and departed, wondering in himself that which was come to pass. Thoughts yet so far? Any questions? The guy has been wondering what the heck is going oh, on. Oh, absolutely. And then I think the, lady, the women came in after the fact that said that Mary was crying there. That's right. And that on that occurrence, the angels then showed up and said, you know, why are you crying? You know, right. and explained it to them. So, so far in the story, we've got it's the first day of the week, it was dark when they were coming. They did not see the stone being rolled away, but they saw that it had been rolled away already. There was some kind of an angelic encounter. One says the angel of the Lord sat upon the stone. Two of the accounts say that they went into the tomb. One account says there was one angel spoke. Another one says that there were two there. Right? Not necessarily a contradiction, just two different versions of the story. And they went back and told the disciples, we get in Luke that Peter came, looked in, saw the linen clothes laying by themselves, and he walked away saying, what in the world is going on? Right? That's kind of what we've got so far. If we jump back to Mark a second, Mark 16, we'll go ahead and cover where Mary Magdalene meets Jesus. Because that seems to be the last major event of the morning. It says in verse 9 of Mark 16, Now when Jesus was risen early in the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. That's where we find out a little bit of background information there. And she went and told them, um, she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they heard that he was alive, and had been seen of her, believed not. After they appeared in another form unto the two of them as they walked, that's talking about the road of Emmaus. So Mark gives us a very, very, very short blurb of it. And verse 9 is really all we get. That he appeared first to Mary Magdalene out of whom he cast seven devils. That's all we get from Mark of that account. John gives us the most detailed. So we'll skip back to John and we'll address some questions you might have. So, verse 11 of John 20. This seems to be an entirely separate account in a, of an encounter with just Mary alone. Yeah, verse, chapter 20 of John, verse 11. So, up to this point, the angelic encounters seem to have occurred with a group of women, right? We get an account of there was an angel sitting on the stone. We have an account of there was a young man sitting to the side. We get an account of there were two men that spoke to them, which is true, all of them, right? I mean, we can't limit it to just one or two angels here or there. Maybe there's a bunch of angels. <laughs> and just certain ones stuck out to the different writers, you know, as they're writing. Here we see another account that mentions two angels. But this seems to be a little bit later in the morning, separate from the other accounts uh, that we've read already. It says in verse 11, But Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She said unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. And he said to her, unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said unto him, Sir, if thou have been born him hence, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. She thought this guy had taken Jesus' body. Jesus said unto her, Mary, I can imagine that moment. 
you know, The Chosen does a pretty awesome job in episode two of season one where he calls her Mary, and she's like, how did, you know, is this this moment? We don't know that that actually occurred, but we know here in this moment he calls her Mary, and she realizes who it is. She turned herself and said to him, Rabboni, uh, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus said to her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told that the, uh, told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. So those are all four accounts. Um, there is a little bit of... Yeah, they, they do seem to be not completely lining up with each other, but I don't think it's because of inconsistencies or contradictions. It's just we get different pieces of the story from different writers. What do you all make of this? The people that were writing the, the verses, uh, Matthew and John, that, that they uh, were telling a different point of view because, you know, okay, how did, uh, how did for example, uh, John know what Mary experienced? Well, Mary told him. Exactly. Honestly, and then right. he wrote it down. Right. Well, you know, <laughs> and we know John and Peter were the only two disciples listed as being there, right? Yeah. We knew that they knew Mary Magdalene, so obviously they had conversations, I'm sure, later. One interesting question is, where did Mark and Luke get their information from? That's the point. And they were, we know, through history, they traveled with Paul and also spent a lot of time with Peter. And we know Peter was there, so they must have had these conversations later and sat and wrote down their account. We know that Mark is the earliest account, right? All the other Gospels seem to have been written in the 80s, whereas Mark seems to have been written possibly as early as 60. Um, so just a lot of interesting things, yes? Well, I was just going back to the different perspectives. When you see a crime, or when right. you're involved in an automobile accident, you never get the exact same story from, from everyone all that the people. Exactly. Not that they're wrong, it's just that was their perspective of how things occurred. All right. And again, some of these, the information came from conversations later after all that. Plus, as you pointed out, Lisa, this is such a chaotic scene. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, and they've done that with crime scene investigations. Like they've interviewed a bunch of people, and some people say it was wearing an orange coat, or a, some people say it was a blue coat. It's like they just miss some of the details. I tend not to go in that direction though, because what does the Bible say about itself? All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Um, so which is correct? I say it's all correct. Right? We just have to put it in its perspective and in its place. Um, what else do you? get out of this mm -hmm. thing you just learn like, like you know certain gospels decided to leave out certain information to highlight other information right that they wanted to because i mean that was even present with like luke talking about the ear being healed right but then you have no one else talking about that so he just wanted to highlight that that one piece as of opposed to everybody else and that makes sense for luke to do that because he was a physician right. probably fascinated him <laughs> that Jesus was able to just heal so this guy's ear. Different personalities, they right. add in certain information that say they seem more valuable right. as opposed to other information. Exactly. I like that. Anybody else you guys take from all this? I, I find it to be quite consistent. I yeah, I do too. When you really I look don't at see it, inconsistencies yeah. in the stories, it's just right. a different uh, perspective. <laughs> Two of the, two of the uh, writers, it was first hand for them. Right. Two of the others, there was uh, retelling what someone else had told. Right. I, yeah, I, very I'm with consistent. you. I'm with you. It's very consistent, actually. Well, the one major thing that I take from this is Jesus is alive. <laughs> he rose from the dead. None of them found him still in the tomb. They were all scared to death but excited at the same time and when we put it all together we got something we can trust in that's what I take from all this anybody else got anything 
Anything else? All right, we're a little early, but I'll shut down online. Happy Easter to you guys. And we'll close out, and we'll see you guys next week.